All right, I have a little drive preaching session on my way to work because, you know, somebody's lit a fire and I want to explain some things. So this, this video is going to be about uh, how to judge our brothers. And as a Christian, what I mean by brothers are other believers, people that, that are saved by Jesus Christ, other converts, okay? And so I want this is about how to judge our brothers. This is not about how to judge the world, okay? So I will quickly address it because a lot of people have this idea of judge not, and what that is talking about, if you read the whole verse, instead of just the first two words, the whole paragraph, the whole chapter, it's talking about not to judge hypocritically. Don't judge if you're doing the same things, okay? Uh, you know, it's kind of a take heed lest you fall kind of thing. If, if you judge somebody else as being a sodomite, and you're a sodomite, you know, you're, you're judging them outwardly as a sodomite, but inwardly you're a sodomite, um, then you get your own judgment. Whatever you judge against them, you get for yourself. That's what it's talking about. So it says, basically, that whole bit's about not to judge hypocritically. Now, we know that the Bible teaches that Christians are to judge. Uh, it says that we're supposed to judge, you know, we're, that one day we're going to judge the angels. So how much more should we judge the matters that pertain to this life? And a lot of people have this idea that uh, as Christians, because we have grace, that we should not be judgmental of the world and that the law is not still in effect but they're wrong the law is still in effect for the unbelieving world the law is only out of effect for a christian okay the law is still in effect for the unbelieving world and uh the law still pertains to this life it was righteous four thousand five thousand six thousand years ago it's still righteous today that's still the righteous law it's still god's law he only put away a couple of laws in the new testament and that's the tithe, the Sabbaths, and a few other things. But it wasn't the actual law. It's still wrong to murder. Murderers should still get the death penalty. It's still wrong to commit adultery. Adulterers should still get the death penalty. It's still wrong to commit sodomy. Sodomites should still get the death penalty. Those judgments have not changed. You know, a lot of people think that it's that God just came and he brought grace to the unbelieving world. No, grace is only to the believer. Okay? The unbelieving world, they're still under the law. They're still going to be condemned by the law. And they're still going to be cast into hell as uh, workers of iniquity. So you need to understand that. A lot of people don't understand that. And the, where normally when a Christian argues grace, I'd be, I'd be happy. Because, you know, Christians hardly ever argue grace. But every once in a while, you'll come across a Christian that argues grace and says that, that we should sow grace to murderers, etc., etc., in this life. No. You commit murder, you commit adultery, you commit sodomy, etc., etc., etc. You know, as Christians, we should still seek that the government, not ourselves, that the government uh, does what's right and executes those people. Now, the government has gotten wicked, uh, about as wicked as any sodomite out there, so you really can't get anybody. To, uh, to do what's right nowadays. But uh, Christians are not about just going out there and just taking the law into our own hand and vigilanteism. No, that's not, God does not teach that. The Bible is not for that. That's not what we do. So you do not mistake my hatred for sodomy, my hatred for these disgusting and filthy and vile sins and vile people for the fact that I would go out there and kill these people. I would not lay a finger on these people. Now, if I was in charge of the government, yes, I'd kill them all, 100%. If I ran the government, I would 100% kill them all because that's the job of the government is to protect the people. And who you should who should you protect the people from but the very sickest of predators, the people that cannot exist in society, okay? So that's where God's law comes from. That's the judgment. That's still in, the, in effect for matters to, pertaining to this life. Now, the next type of judgment that, as a Christian, we should make is judgment of salvation. This is also not the subject of this video, but we will address it shortly because um, some people get these things confused. When you start to judge uh, whether a Christian is walking in the flesh or in the spirit, 
people will say you're judging their salvation, but you're not judging their salvation, okay? Judgment of salvation, we understand that salvation is only by grace through faith and not of works. So judge, judging salvation, the only thing that we can do to judge salvation is we can, we can talk to another believer, another person that claims to be a believer, and if they give us a good salvation, if they say they're trusting on Jesus Christ alone for their salvation, and that there's nothing they could do to obtain it, then we believe that they are saved. Now, if they say, I believe in the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but you have to speak in tongues to be saved, you know, if you don't speak in tongues, you don't have the gifts of the Holy Ghost and you're not really saved, then they're not saved. They're giving you a false gospel. You understand? The Bible does not require any work for salvation. Salvation is not of works. That's what the Bible tells us. So anyone that says that salvation is of works, they are abusing scripture. They are stumbling over the milk and they have a false gospel and they are not saved. And that's what the Bible teaches us, that we should judge that they are saved or not saved based on the confession of their lips, okay? So if they tell me a false confession, they can, they can claim the name of Jesus they can say they believe in the death, burial, and resurrection, but if they believe that any of their works are required to be saved, then they're not really trusting on Jesus Christ. They believe that Jesus Christ is. They believe that he existed. They believe that he died, buried, and rose again, but they don't actually trust that for their salvation. They haven't actually called on Jesus Christ to be their savior, okay? They are trying to save themselves. They are trying to call on you know, Jesus plus them. But the Bible makes it very clear that if you try to make it Jesus plus you, it will just be you, you know? And you'll be like the people in Matthew 7 where it says, you know, have I not prophesied in thy name and in thy name cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works. And what does he say to them? Depart from me, you workers of iniquity, okay? Into everlasting death, uh, can, you know, prepared for the devil and his angels or whatever. I don't remember exactly what he says, but that's the basic po point. He takes them and he casts them into hell because they are workers of iniquity. They tried to do their own works for salvation and they failed. Like anybody that ever, ever will ever try to do their own works for salvation. So this is not that judgment. Okay, this is not judging salvation. This is how to judge a brother or sister in Christ. Okay, now when you're judging salvation, you do not judge by works because salvation is not by works. Well, when you're judging a brother or you're judging yourself, how do you judge? Huh? Okay, now the first thing you're gonna have to do is you're gonna have to listen for a second. You judge by works, okay? You judge by works. Now you're not judging that person by works to say that they're an evil person or a justified person. Their salvation has nothing to do with it. You're judging their works to see whether they're walking in the flesh or they're walking in the spirit because the Bible gives us a list. It says the lusts of the flesh are these and it gives you a list of the things that are the lusts of the flesh, the things that the flesh lusts after. Okay? And if you're lusting after those things, what are you in? The flesh. And if I as a brother see you're lusting after those things, what do I know you're in? The flesh. And if I as a brother and I love you and I want you to set forth treasures in heaven, what should I be trying to get you out of? the flesh okay so when I'm judging a brother I should be looking at their works and if they're doing evil things then I should be not out of hatred not I'm not you wicked vile sinner you know take heed lest you fall don't do that do not be the hellfire and condemnation preacher that tells other Christians that they're not right with God because let me tell you something you're not right with God either in your flesh your spirits justified so who are you talking about your spirit is definitely right with God. Your flesh is not right with God. So if you're looking at a brother and you're telling a brother, you're not right with God, let me tell you something, brother. You are not right with God. Okay? You're by your own judgment. You're committing yourself as evil and not right with God. Okay? Understand that. All right? That's not why you tell a brother that they're in sin. What is your heart for a brother? Well, your heart for a brother should be the same as your heart for yourself. You love that brother. Okay? And what, do you, what is your goal in this life, right? To so set forth treasures in heaven, okay? You're trying to set forth treasures in heaven. You don't want the treasures in this life because they're going to be corrupted. The Bible tells us exactly where we should set forth our treasures. We should set forth our treasures in heaven. Now, if I love my brother, where do I want his treasures to be? In this life or in heaven? Well, I want him to be in heaven, okay? So if I see that he's in the flesh, where do I know his treasures are? 
here, okay? He's, he's building up treasures on this light, all right? So if I see that, what should I try to encourage him to do out of love? To stop building up treasures on this life and put his treasures in heaven. Should I do this, you know, with this evil, hateful spirit rebuking and just spitting bile at him? No. No. I wouldn't want him to do that to me. I should not do that to him. Okay? Even if he find if I find him in some of the worst of sins, like the man that had his own father's wife uh, in in uh, that that Paul was basically judging. Paul wasn't judging that man out of hatred. Paul wanted to cast that man out of church for what reason? To deliver his flesh to the devil. Why? So that his spirit would be saved. So that he would get right. So that he would get back in the spirit. You know what happens when a Christian gets real deep in the flesh? One of two things. God takes their life, they die. Or they get right. Okay? That's one of those two things happen. Okay? And so Paul's delivering up him up to the devil. And your spirit and the devil are incompatible. And so a war begins, okay? And, and one of two things happen. Either you die before you get right, or you get right. One of those two things happen, okay? And so as a Christian, that's what Paul was doing. Paul was trying to get that man as quickly as possible back on the right road so that he could start setting up treasures in heaven. Paul was doing that purely out of love. Paul was not hating that man. He was not angry with that man. He did not deliver that man up to the courts, etc., etc., etc. He did it. He dealt with it as with a brother. You understand that? That's how you judge brethren. Okay? Now, how did he judge that man? He judged him by his works. Okay? He didn't say the man was unsaved. He didn't say the man wasn't a brother. Okay? He looked at his works. He corrected him. And you know what? That man got right. He was back in the church in no time. I don't know how long it took, but, uh, it was reported later on that he was back in church, okay? So, you understand that. So as a Christian, a lot of times these, you know, preachers, and I struggle to call them preachers because they don't know anything, and they're elevated in their pride. But they will sit there and they will look at a brother and they will put their finger in his face and say, if you don't go to church three times a week, you know, you're not right with God. And they will just sit there and do this and do that. And just, they'll just rail on that brother like he's a dog, okay? And I got news for them. By all their judgments, they're going to be judged, okay? Their life is going to get what they want that person to have in their life. You understand? The Lord is not going to let it go, okay? When you're out there and you're, you're treating your brethren that way, the Lord is not going to let it go. You understand that? Okay? You're supposed to love your brother as you'd love yourself. Now, how would you want yourself rebuked if you got in the flesh? Would you want that person... Here's here's what you're basically doing, okay? Let's say if you were, uh, you were fornicating, okay? And I looked at you and I said, You disgusting fornicator! You're not right with God, etc., etc., etc. And I just railed on my brother. And now... Now he's he, he's convicted. He feels evil. Okay, so now what is what did he do? Now he's going to start trying to not fornicate. Why? So that he can be righteous. So what did I just provoke him to do? I just provoked him to grab his filthy rags and try to wash himself off with his own righteousness. But he's already washed. He's already been washed by God. What I've just done is I've just provoked that man to go back into his own filth, to wallow in his own filth to wallow in the mud, to clean himself off with filthy rags. I've done nothing for the man. Nothing good anyway. You understand that? I just I just rushed him back to, to the sow that was washed, wallowing in the mud again. That's all I've done. Now he's going to be trying to clean himself off with his works. I've done nothing. I've made him to commit the worst sin that a brother in Christ can commit, is to think that you, that you, oh vain man, that you can do anything to make yourself righteous before God. What a slap in the face. That's the worst slap in the face that a Christian can do is to try to, to make himself righteous. It's not what you do. As a brother, what I do is if I saw a brother that was, that was weak in the, faith, in the faith, that he was walking in the flesh, he was full of lust and covetousness and 
and complaining and backbiting or whatever, what would I do to that brother? Well, obviously, I would not rail on that brother for one, for one simple reason. Take heed lest ye fall. I am a man too. I am subject to like passions. I have the same sin nature in me. And if I judge that brother harshly, guess who's going to judge me harshly? Yeah, I don't want the Lord judging me harshly. So what do I do with that brother? Well, I try to get him back into the fold. Okay? I go to that brother and I say, Hey, brother, you know, I understand that this stuff sucks. You know, I understand that this stuff is terrible. I understand that it's not fun. I understand that, you know, I, I'm with you. I understand that. But brother... You're in the flesh. And I want you not to have rewards in this life. I want you to have rewards in the next life. I want you to set up rewards in heaven, brother. So put your eyes on God. Put your eyes on that, that better reward, okay? And earn treasures in heaven, not treasures in this life, okay? If you clean up your, your life just because, say, say with an alcoholic. I find somebody there, an alcoholic. And that person decides that I'm going to be righteous before God. And they just put their willpower on it. And they just spend their the rest of their life not drinking alcohol so that they can be righteous before God. Okay? They're going to spend their entire life earning a reward that's going to be burnt up. They're going to lose it. Their reward will only be in this life those things that come from no longer drinking alcohol. You understand? That will be their only reward. But if rather, I tell that brother, hey, you know, you're, you're being a drunkard, and that's evidence that you're walking in the flesh, okay? Brother, you need to get back into the faith. You need to put your trust back on the Lord and that greater reward. Don't stop drinking because you think you're having righteousness before Jesus Christ if you, start drink, you stop drinking. Just set your treasures up in heaven. Stop drinking because you want a heavenly reward. Strive for the mark, brother. We're all in a race. Strive for the mark. I, for sure, want you to have a thousand times the, the rewards that I will have in heaven. I want to have to walk up 200 floors to get to your mansion. I want to be at the bottom of the hill while you're near the top of the hill, my brother. Okay? That's, that's my heart. That's what I want for you. So I want you to set your treasures up in heaven. That's what I want for you. Okay? Do you understand how the heart of that is different? One of it is you love your brother and you want him to have what you want you to have. Rewards in heaven. Okay? You want him to set up rewards. For two, it puts his eyes where? On Christ. It puts his eyes on rewards that are in heaven. If I tell him to stop sinning because he's not right with God, well, where does that put his eyes? On himself. Now he's focused on stopping sinning. Now he's trying to wipe himself off with his filthy rags. He's trying to offer the Lord his righteousness, which he never had any to offer to begin with. You understand the difference? There's a difference here when you're judging your brethren. You understand? Now when you're judging the world, you're convincing them of sin because they, they don't know that they're, they're sinners. You have to convince them of sin so that they know they need a savior. But that's the only function of convicting somebody of sin. What's the point of convicting someone of sin after that? If they already understand they're a sinner, what's the point of convicting them of sin after that? No, you're telling them, hey, look, these are the lusts of the spirit. These are the lusts of the flesh. I see you, brother. You're in the flesh. I see you. You're walking in the lusts of the flesh. Hey, brother, I need you to get back to here. The lusts of the spirit. Why? Why do I do that? Because I love that brother. It's the right heart. It's having the right heart. Do you understand that? I get so tired of, of these hellfire and condemnation preachers that go out there and they'll say that I'm being cowardly. They like to call me a coward or they like to tell me because I, you know, I'm so full of sins. But I would almost guarantee that my righteousness, you know, speaking as a fool, my righteousness in the flesh uh, exceeds theirs. You know, I don't care about my righteousness of the flesh. I'm just saying, by their own bar, you know, I would 
gar almost guarantee, especially with most of these people, that, you know, my flesh righteousness would exceed theirs. You know, I don't drink. I don't smoke. All I do is raise a family. Don't party. Never party. Don't, don't do anything. You know, I don't do anything crazy. Nothing. You know, uh, I can't think of anything. You know, I, I just try to live my life and be thankful. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean I'm not in sin. That doesn't mean I don't sin. That doesn't mean I don't get in the flesh. Okay? Now, let's go back to this drunkard analogy. Okay? So now, I've dealt, there's two ways to deal with it. I try to get that drunkard to stop being a drunkard so that he can offer some righteousness before Christ. What have I done for that man? Nothing. You know, he's now taking some working to earn something that he isn't going to earn. He might spend the rest of his life trying to earn something that he'll never have. Okay? So what have I done for that man? Nothing. If anything, I've done bad for him. I've done evil to him. Okay? Now, if I then, to the same brother, I tell him, hey, you know, you're being a drunkard, you're living in the flesh, I want you to set forth treasures in heaven. Put your, put your eyes on God. Don't go to the drink for an earthly reward of, you know, having a little bit of a happy feeling for a little while or forgetting your misery and your sorrows for a few minutes. Go to the Lord for a heavenly reward, for an eternal reward that nothing will ever break through or steal and will not be burnt up. Go for that reward. Now, if that brother now and again falls back into the drink, what 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 he what should I say to him? Well, what did James say to him? He said, "Count it all joy, brethren." What did he say? Count it all joy, brethren, when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing that the trial of your faith worketh patience, and patience temperance. What he's basically saying is, the more you fall into temptation, the better you get at avoiding that temptation. The better, the more you sow to the spirit the better you get at staying in the Spirit and reap into the Spirit. Okay? And when you fall and you get back, then you get better at not falling because you learn from those experiences. Okay? That's what James is working on. That's what he's trying to tell. He's trying to, you know, move Christians to perfection. And you'll notice, this is kind of a sidebar, but you'll notice people that try to move to perfection, once they start trying to move to perfection, they start telling Christians to, to be looking at their works, people will always make it about salvation. They will always make it about salvation. They'll always start preaching heresy and what's inside their heart will come out and they'll start revealing that they are not saved, that they're not actually trusting on Jesus Christ. Okay? And if you preach James, what James is preaching, that you should judge a person, judge a brother's works, okay, that, you know, because he was talking about a brother in that, in that context, okay, you should judge a brother's works, you should say, hey man, show me your faith by your works, okay, because if you really trust Jesus Christ, if you really trust that there's a greater reward in heaven, then you'll by nature keep the law, okay, so the works will follow by nature. So he's saying, show me your, 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 your faith by your works. Okay, if you actually believe it, then the nature will follow. He's trying to preach to Christians how to become better Christians. But every time somebody does that, it starts to sound like they're preaching a work salvation because people make it about salvation. When it's not about salvation, it has nothing to do with salvation. Okay, it's the same with Paul when he starts talking about moving on to perfection. I think it's in Hebrews 6 where he talks about, okay, let's not lay again the doctrine of repentance and uh, repentance uh, from dead works and a faith towards God. He's like, let's not go back to the milk. Let's move on to perfection. And man, some of them chapters coming up are some of the hardest to divide chapters because what's he doing? He's preaching to Christians, okay? Now, understand this. As Christians, we have this problem of when we look at a, say, at a brother, we see one person. This is an error. Okay, we know, doctrinally, we already know that that is an old man and a new man. You should see two people. You understand that? 
you should in your mind know that that is two people. And if you see that he is walking in the spirit, and if you don't see any open sin, then you should just give him the benefit of the doubt and believe that the brother is walking in the spirit. Okay? But if you look at that brother and he's in the lust of the flesh, and the Bible tells you what the fruits of the spirit and the lust of the flesh are, it's not hard to determine whether a person's in the flesh or in the spirit. Okay, the Bible tells you what to do. Okay, then you look at that brother, you're moving on to perfection, and then you judge. Okay, there's a particular preacher. Uh, I would consider him one of my greatest friends, and I don't want to mention his name because I don't know if he would want to be mentioned or not. But he's basically preaching a sermon, and he's talking about that when you get saved, you get the Holy Spirit. And he says, you know, that there are some things that follow. You understand that? Now, when you get saved, for sure, the Spirit begins to work. That's what he's saying. He's not saying that you start to sow to the Spirit. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying that you automatically begin to sow to the Spirit and you become a good Christian. He very specifically says that's not what he's saying. Okay? But what he's saying is the Spirit does begin to work. It doesn't just sit there idle. Okay? And it begins to start pricking your heart and telling you what you should and should not do. Okay? And you start to have different lusts and things like this. And you start to be convicted of things that you weren't convicted of before. But that doesn't mean as a Christian that you're going to listen every time the Spirit talks or even any time the Spirit talks. Okay? The Spirit could, you could ignore the Spirit till you die for days, months, weeks, or years. And it will not affect whether you're saved or not. But that does not mean that the Spirit is not working. The Spirit is still consenting to the law that it is good. The Spirit is still telling you, hey, stay away from this, stay away from this, stay away from this. The, st the Spirit is still doing its job. You're just ignoring it. That's not the Spirit's fault that you're so into the flesh. The Spirit is consenting to the law that it is good. Your Spirit is trying to lead you in the right path. You're just refusing to obey. Do you understand that? So, a lot of people, for whatever reason, whenever you start to talk about moving on to perfection as a Christian, a lot of people will start saying that you're preaching heresy. They will start, you know, they got to make it about salvation. And here's the problem with those people. Those people are weak, weak, weak Christians. They're very weak Christians. And they barely understand the milk, okay? But they don't understand that they're very weak Christians, they don't understand that they're very unknowledgeable Christians. They think they're very very highly knowledgeable Christians. They think they're the strongest of the strong Christians. That's how they feel about themselves. So what they have to do then is they just have to make the milk the meat. And they just have to just not even say that there is any strong meat. You know, they just, they just have to make it to where you, there's not even any moving toward perfection. You know, once you understand the gospel, perfection's achieved. You cannot get better than that. Okay? Because they're weak in the faith, because they're weak in the doctrine, because they're not well knowledgeable, but they're proud and they're puffed up, they must accept that, that the milk is the meat and that there's no such thing as meat. They throw the meat out. Because if there's meat, that there, if there's things they don't understand, then they're not as great and knowledgeable as they think they are. And that, like, nothing could be worse to them than that. Okay? Let me tell you what a Christian's heart should be. Let me tell you exactly what a Christian's heart should be. A Christian should not have any stock in what the truth is. A Christian should not care not one ounce what the truth is. And what I mean by that is, the truth could be this or that or this or that. They don't have any stock in it. All they should care is what the truth is so that they can believe it okay in other words they shouldn't be trying to influence the truth to be this or that okay now most Christians they want something to be the truth so then they force the Bible to fit into that because they have stock in this one path and so they twist the Bible to get it over to their path because they have stock in what the truth is don't be like those Christians don't have any stock in what the truth is. Just try to know the truth so that you can believe it. You understand? I'm not saying that you shouldn't want to know the truth. 
I'm saying that you should want to know the truth, but you shouldn't care what the truth is. You shouldn't have any stock in it. You shouldn't be trying to make the truth migrate to your position. You should be just trying to find out what the truth is so that you can be in line with it. Do you understand that? Anytime you get to talking about the deeper things of the Bible, it gets confusing. It gets hard to explain because it's very hard to explain these things to people because they've been taught so many lies their entire lives and they have to see everything through their little lens that they built for themselves. But I just want to make I just wanted to make this point clear, all right? Now going back to the drunkard analogy, understand this. Who has done the best for that Christian? The person that has preached to him and convicted him of his sin and told him what a wicked sinner he is and told him that he's not right with God and now he never drinks again. Let's say he never drinks again and he just spends the rest of his life trying to work his righteousness out, trying to just earn righteousness. He's not doing it because he trusts in the Lord. He's not doing it cheerfully and of a willing heart. He's doing it begrudgingly because it's the law. Okay, you've done nothing for him. You've actually just taken his, his rewards now and his rewards in the future. You've taken both of his rewards. Okay, his rewards in this life, gone. His rewards in the next life, gone. What have you done for him, oh vain preacher? Nothing. Okay, now analyze this. You tell this Christian, not that, not that, you don't try to fix the symptom. Okay, you don't give him Tylenol for a headache. You try to fix what's causing the headache. You understand? As, as, a, as a Christian, we're not <coughs> out there trying to convince a person of their sin that is saved. They already know they're a sinner. They had to know that before they got saved. Okay? That's the first thing they had to know. All right? We're not trying to convince them of sin. That's done. Okay? What, they're tr what we're trying to convince them of is that there's better rewards in heaven than there are on this earth. You get a better reward from not being a drunkard than you do from being a drunkard. Because if you be a drunkard, you get a reward this life. If you don't be a drunkard, you're getting that reward next life. You know, that is if, you're, if your heart is perfect, if your eyes are looking to heaven. If you're looking for that heavenly reward. So even if that Christian does fall into drinking time and time again, say he falls into drinking again a couple months later, and then he comes out, and this time he stays out for six months. And then he comes out and the next time he stays out of drinking and earn it and he starts he has his eyes on the Lord for a year and then he falls into drinking again comes into a hard time and he drinks for a couple of months and then he he falls he comes out again and, and he puts his eyes back on the Lord and he starts seeking an eternal reward and he, say he doesn't drink for two years and then the next time five years and then the next time ten years that's what James is teaching the trial of his faith has worked patience He's gotten more temperate. He's gotten better at controlling his desires. He's gotten better at putting the members of the flesh in subjugation to the Spirit. This is the whole point of moving on to perfection. You're trying to become a better witness for others, and you're trying to earn more rewards in heaven. This is why Paul said we should not win the prize if we, unless we strive lawfully. Okay? That's what he's saying. The prize is your treasures in heaven. You're striving lawfully for that mark because your 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 goal is to earn, is to set forth treasures in heaven. Okay? And if you're going out there and you're living like the rest of the world, the, the rest of the world's Christians who just they they've got all the best sayings with their mouth, but they live their life completely and totally in the flesh. And whenever they're not living in the flesh, whenever they, whenever they stop doing a sin, it's not because they're setting forth the treasure in heaven. That's not why. It's because they are, uh, they're trying to, you know, prove their own righteousness to the Lord by being a good person. And they're missing the whole point. It's the wrong spirit. It's the wrong spirit. Okay? Our goal is not hellfire and condemnation. Okay? That's to the lost. Okay? You're trying to convince them of hellfire and condemnation just so that they'll stop being lost. Just so that they'll want that salvation. Just so that they'll be convinced of sin. So that they'll know that they're a sinner on their way to hell and they'll attempt to look for Jesus. 
That's the only reason. Okay? It does no good beyond that. Okay? And once a person is saved, they've already accepted that they're a sinner. There's really no point in convincing them of sin anymore. But what they should be doing and what you should be doing is you should be looking at the fruits of the Spirit. If you have the fruits of the Spirit, then you're walking in the Spirit. But if you have the lusts of the flesh, then you're walking in the flesh. And as a Christian, if I'm looking at you, I should be judging it the same way. And my love for you should be to set forth treasures in heaven. And your love for me should be that I set forth treasures in heaven. And we should be sharpening each other and honing each other to this end. Either way, God bless.